It was a quiet Saturday evening when I first met my new neighbor. I was taking out the trash around dusk when I noticed a moving truck parked in front of the house next door. As I walked down my driveway, a tall, slender man with greasy hair and wire-rimmed glasses emerged from the back of the truck, carrying a large cardboard box. He caught my eye and smiled. He greeted me and told me his name was Edgar, and he had just moved in next door. I hesitantly walked over and introduced myself, extending a hand that he grasped with bony fingers. His palm was clammy against mine. He told me to let him know if I needed help unpacking or anything, and then he grinned again before disappearing into his house. I couldn't help but feel unsettled as I finished taking out the trash. Something about Edgar gave me the creeps, but I figured I shouldn't judge him just yet. After all, I barely knew the man. Over the next few weeks, I saw Edgar periodically while coming and going. He mostly kept to himself, often sitting on his front porch smoking cigarettes late into the night. I noticed him watching me from his window a few times as I mowed the lawn or got into my car. His unwavering stare made my skin crawl. One night around 2 a.m. I was startled awake by the sound of loud banging coming from Edgar's house. I peered out the window to see him in his driveway wildly swinging a baseball bat at a crudely made scarecrow. Edgar's eyes were wide and frenzied as he beat the lifeless figure without pause, letting out crazed yell after yell. I considered calling the police, but eventually he wore himself out and retreated inside. Needless to say, I didn't sleep well the rest of the night. My partner Alex didn't like Edgar from the start and cautioned me to keep my distance. I promised I would be careful, but the truth was I felt terrible for the guy. He clearly wasn't right in the head and had no family or friends as far as I could tell. One Saturday, I gathered my courage and knocked on his door, offering to take him to lunch so he could get out of the house. Edgar looked surprised but happily accepted. We drove separately to a nearby diner. Edgar talked non-stop through lunch about government conspiracies, aliens and demons disguised as politicians. His bizarre ramblings and shrill laugh put me on edge. As we left the restaurant, Edgar suggested we exchange phone numbers in case of emergencies. Reluctantly, I gave him my cell number but soon regretted this act of kindness. Edgar proceeded to call and text me incessantly over the next few weeks. He asked me strange personal questions and invited me over to his house at odd hours. I dodged his attempts to meet up, making excuses that I was busy with work. My politeness eventually faded as his obsession worsened. One night, Edgar called me at 3 a.m., ranting about someone trying to break into his house. When I didn't answer, he left a voicemail pleading for help. Against my better judgment, I ran over to make sure he was okay. When I got there, Edgar was wielding a baseball bat and urging me inside to fight off the intruder, and no one else was there. Clearly delusional, he had imagined the entire episode. I managed to talk him down and get out of there as quick as I could. Things escalated when I came home from work early one day to find Edgar inside my house, rifling through my closet. He had broken in somehow and claimed he was checking for surveillance devices. I screamed at him to get out and threatened to call the police. He left reluctantly, warning me that dangerous forces were closing in. That night, I changed all my locks and installed a security system. I avoided Edgar at all costs, but noticed him leering from his window whenever I went outside. A few mornings later, I awoke to find my tires slashed. My gut told me Edgar was responsible. Fearing what he might do next, Alex and I went to the police and filed a report. They increased patrols around our block, but said there wasn't enough evidence to arrest him yet. Things escalated further when I came home to find a rabid stray cat crucified on my front porch. It was surrounded by burnt-out candles and satanic symbols drawn in blood. The stench was overpowering. Edgar stood on his porch watching me with an evil grin on his face. He wasn't even trying to hide his harassment at this point. That night, Alex and I decided we were no longer safe in our own home. We discreetly packed our essentials and booked a hotel room across town. In the morning, we returned to find our front door battered in and various rooms ransacked. Frightening messages were scrawled on the walls in what appeared to be blood. We drove to the police station and showed them photos of the scene. They now had ample evidence to arrest Edgar for home invasion, vandalism, animal cruelty and harassment. Two officers escorted us home so we could quickly grab more of our belongings before staying somewhere else indefinitely. As the police knocked on Edgar's front door, all hell broke loose inside the house. We heard Edgar scream as blasts rang out from a shotgun. The officers rushed in, but it was too late. Edgar had turned the gun on himself rather than face arrest. We later learned he had been off his bipolar medications and slipped into psychosis. 
His descent into madness was tragic yet terrifying. We eventually moved to get away from the horrific memories of that house. I still get paranoid any time someone new moves in next door. That experience will haunt me forever, a chilling reminder that you truly never know what darkness lies within someone until they reveal their true nature. I'm just thankful we escaped alive and that no one else will fall prey to the sinister evil that lurked within my deranged former neighbor Edgar. I was excited to know our neighbors when we first moved into our new home. The house to our left was occupied by an elderly couple who had lived there for decades. They seemed like perfectly nice people. However, the house on the right had been vacant for some time, and I was curious who might move in. One day a moving truck pulled up to the empty house. I watched from our front window as a tall, skinny man with jet black hair stepped out of a black SUV. He looked to be in his late thirties or early forties and was dressed in all black. Something about his pale complexion and cold stare gave me the chills. Over the next few hours, some movers unloaded boxes and furniture into the house. The man stood by, watching them intently. I never saw him lend a hand. Later that week, my husband James and I walked over to introduce ourselves. We rang the doorbell and could hear classical music playing inside. After a minute, the front door opened a crack. A pair of icy blue eyes peered out from the shadows. Yes, the man asked in a raspy voice. We told him our names and welcomed him to the neighborhood. He didn't open the door any wider or step outside, and he muttered in our faces before closing the door. Over the next few weeks, we saw little of our new neighbor. Once in a while, we'd spot him leaving in his SUV, always wearing black suits. He never waved or acknowledged us when we were both outside. The blinds stayed shut day and night. The classical music played at all hours, loud enough to hear outside at times. Other neighbors told us they had knocked to introduce themselves too, but the man never answered. One late evening, James took our dog Bailey out for a walk. When they didn't return after thirty minutes, I started to worry. Just as I was about to call for a search party, James came rushing through the front door. He was out of breath, and Bailey was whimpering with her tail between her legs. James said they were walking past the neighbor's house when Bailey started barking at the man's front door. There was a strange smell coming from inside the house. Before he could pull Bailey away, the front door flew open. The tall man towered over them, staring daggers at Bale, telling James to keep his filthy mutt off his property. James said he didn't respond, but practically dragged Bailey all the way home. I didn't like the sound of our creepy neighbor threatening us. The next day, I called the non-emergency police line to file a report. The dispatcher took down the details, but said there wasn't much they could do without evidence of a crime. I realized we would just have to steer clear of the man as much as possible. Things only got more disturbing from there. Soon we noticed a nasty stench coming from the direction of the neighbor's house. It smelled like rotting garbage mixed with a tinge of iron. I gagged a little whenever I went outside. Other neighbors said they smelled it too. Someone filed a complaint with the homeowners association, but they never followed up on it. Then the noises started. At random hours of the day or night, blood-curdling screams would come from the neighbor's house. They sounded like torturous howls of pure agony. James and I would leap out of bed in panic. The screams always stopped after a few minutes. If we called the police, they never found anything suspicious next door. We lost countless hours of sleep worrying about what might be happening over there. Late one night, I awoke to use the bathroom. As I sat on the toilet, I heard a loud bang against the side of our house. Then clawing and scraping sounds started coming through the bathroom wall we shared with the neighbor's house. It sounded like an animal viciously trying to dig its way through. I jumped up with my heart pounding. The clawing stopped as suddenly as it had started. James groggily insisted it was just rats when I woke him, but I knew rats didn't make those kinds of noises. The last straw was when we witnessed the neighbor dragging a large wrapped bundle from his SUV into his house in the dead of night. The plastic wrapping wasn't fully closed, and a limp human hand flopped out. Bile rose in my throat as we watched from our bedroom window in horror. James wanted to call the police right then, but I convinced him to wait till morning when we could discreetly observe the house again. We stayed up all night watching and waiting. At the first sight of daylight, we crept outside, walked past the stench, and peered into the neighbor's front window. A pair of icy blue eyes glared back at us. We sprinted back to our house and immediately dialed 911. Soon police cars and forensic vans swarmed the street. They broke down the front door and raided the house. Moments later, two officers marched out with the neighbor in handcuffs. Inside, they found body parts from multiple victims hidden in every room. 
The classical music had been playing to muffle the screams. Later, we learned our neighbor's name was Damien Rowe. He was a suspected serial killer wanted for gruesome murders across several states. We realized how close we'd come to being his next victims. Needless to say, we put that house up for sale. I still get chills thinking about the harvest of horror growing right next door. We were lucky to make it out alive. When we first moved into our new home, I was excited to finally have a place of our own. My wife Jane and I had searched for months before finding this cute two-story house with a big backyard. It wasn't in the best neighborhood, but the price was right for our budget. After the movers left, I stood out front admiring our new place. That's when I first noticed the house next door. It was an old Victorian-style home, at least a hundred years old. The paint was peeling, the windows were cracked and foggy, and the front yard was wildly overgrown. Obviously, no one had lived there for a long time. I told Jane it looks like we have a classic haunted house next door, but she rolled her eyes at me, telling me that she didn't believe in ghosts or any of that stuff. Our first couple weeks in the new house were great. We were busy unpacking boxes and arranging furniture. At night, we cuddled on the couch, happy in our little love nest. But as the days went by, I started to notice some strange things. I would hear odd noises coming from the empty house next door banging, scraping sounds that would wake me up at night. When I glanced out the window into the neighbor's yard, I thought I saw pale faces staring back at me from the broken windows. One night I woke with a start at 2 a.m. I had heard a loud crashing sound. I crept to the window and peered outside. The front door of the abandoned house next door was wide open. The wind must have blown it open, I realized with relief. Still, I didn't sleep well that night. The next morning, over breakfast, I told Jane about the spooky house. I knew it sounded crazy, but I think that place might actually be haunted. Jane laughed, telling me it's just an old house and there's nothing supernatural about it. I wanted to believe her, but I couldn't shake the eerie feeling the house gave me. That night I woke suddenly at 3 a.m. and felt compelled to look out the window. In the moonlight I could see someone standing very still in the neighbor's front yard, staring right at our house. The figure was still there when I looked again. All I could make out was a tall silhouette of what looked like a man wearing a hat. I ran to Jane and shook her awake. She was annoyed to be woken up, but got out of bed to look out the window with me. The figure was still there, standing motionless and staring in our direction. We watched for several minutes, but the figure did not move. Eventually, we crept back to bed, but neither of us slept that night. In the morning, Jane agreed that something strange was happening with the house next door. We decided to do some research to find out the property's history. At the local library, we spent hours digging through old archives. We discovered that a doctor had built and lived in the Victorian house in the 1800s. He'd been experimenting with new medical procedures on patients without consent. There were rumors he conducted bizarre surgeries in the basement of his home. Then, over a hundred years ago, the doctor mysteriously vanished without a trace. His house had sat empty ever since. Jane and I now realized we were living next to the home of a twisted, mad doctor who was probably haunting it even in death. But the worst was yet to come. That night a huge thunderstorm rolled in. Lightning strikes lit up the sky as we ate dinner. The light suddenly flickered out. The storm must have knocked out power on our block. I found some candles so we could see. Over the howling wind and booming thunder, we heard the sound of shattering glass. We rushed to the front windows. In a flash of lightning, we saw a horrifying sight. The front window of the doctor's house was broken, and there was a man was climbing inside. I grabbed our baseball bat and opened the front door and I stepped cautiously onto our front porch. Just then, lightning illuminated the entire scene. The doctor was standing in the doorway of his house, staring directly at me. His face was grotesquely disfigured, stitches and scars in a hideous patchwork. One eye was enlarged and bulging. He grinned an awful grin and started shambling towards me. I stood frozen in terror as the monster approached. When he was almost upon me, I swung the bat with all my might. With a loud crack, it smashed into him. The creature collapsed into a pile of clothes on my front lawn. Inside the hat and coat was nothing but a pile of empty clothes. Jane and I grabbed our bags and fled that house, never to return. We moved far away to a new neighborhood. I'll never forget that night we came face to face with the mad doctor's ghost. Sometimes I still have nightmares about that empty grin coming towards me in the darkness. After that experience, I'll always be suspicious of the creepy old house next door.